morning. morning. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I think uh, we've got some storms scheduled today. The weather, the weather men do at least, and uh, only God knows what kind of weather we'll have. I believe uh, these days. Let's be standing. Uh, remain standing for the the song. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for today, and we thank you for all of our brothers and sisters here in this house. Father, be with us this morning as we worship you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. May you stand it for joyful, joyful.
Jesus, I love you. so look the world. <clears throat> <clears throat> morning. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, uh, this time of communion. 
I've, I've been thinking about this for uh, quite a while. Uh, uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, some bad news uh, and some good news. Uh, you know, it seems like that every time we uh, turn on the TV or our computers or our phones or whatever, uh, there's always bad news. That is the narrative. They, it just seems that I guess people want to hear it. I don't know. I, I don't like bad news. Um, uh, you know, like they had the in Hawaii uh, and, you know, the war in the Ukraine and just, it goes on and on. Uh, and even when we uh, come around this table, you know, uh, first part of the story is that uh, Christ was uh, crucified and uh, uh, languished on that cross and uh, uh, was beaten and bloodied and uh, that's, you know, that's uh, kind of a bitter pill to swallow. But on the other hand, uh, three days later, he rose uh, with victory over death so that we could have forgiveness of sin and that is the good news that uh, I wanted to present today uh, that that his resurrection his the resurrecting power that God had uh, uh, given him so that we can have uh, forgiveness of sin so as we go about our daily lives um, we can draw strength from the good news and we carry it with us all the days of our life. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, God in heaven, we thank you for the good news of your Son who died and rose again on the third day that we might have forgiveness of sin. And Lord, as we go about our daily lives, Lord, uh, let it always be in our memory uh, that great sacrifice and the good news that um, we can have victory over sin and death. And I just pray these things in Christ Jesus' most holy name. Amen.
Let's all rise for the reading of God's word. I'll be reading from 1 Samuel 17, 20 through 26. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and herd to the camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of his unit. See how your brothers are, are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all of the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up, and set out, as Jesse, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to the battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, Do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great, great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. David asked the man standing near, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for Brother Tim. We ask your blessing upon him as he breaks open your word to us and shares it with us. Go with us now through the rest of this service. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Glad you're here today. Turn, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. One of the... Uh, Maybe the most familiar story in the Old Testament, certainly one of them. I was thinking this morning, uh, a few years ago, Jesse and one of my son-in-laws and I uh, went to a movie. And uh, we got, you know how it is, you sit for a few minutes and watch, and then they get to the re real previews, and those last for 15, 20 minutes. And then when you're finally ready to start the real movie, the lights come down and there's that, I, I, I don't know, Paramount or whatever it is. That's the last thing I remember seeing. Um, we got in those leather chairs and it was reclined back. I woke up, there wasn't 15 minutes left in the movie. I didn't know who anybody was. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, so Jesse and I went to a movie, oh, a week or two ago. It was on my birthday uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we went in and I knew it was going to be a long movie. And we were in those black leather recliners and leaned back and it was cool and it was dark. And so I started early on telling myself, I'm going to stay awake. I am going to make it through this movie. I wanted to see this one I was interested in. And so I started really talking to myself, stay awake, focus, do not let yourself go to sleep. So I'm encouraging you, it's gray out this morning. <laughs> and it would have been a great morning to have slept in. I am fully aware of that. But I want you to start doing a little talking to yourself. I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, to 1 Samuel 17. I appreciate uh, Joyce read for us there uh, a little bit of a longer segment. We're going to read another longer piece here in chapter 17 as well. We started two weeks ago, actually. Last week uh, was our uh, meal packing thing, and I just thought that went very, very well. Uh, but two weeks ago, we started a sermon series on the life of David. And if you remember, I mentioned to you that story about, before we started, that story about Jesus after the resurrection on the road to Emmaus. It's in Luke chapter 24. The two disciples didn't recognize Jesus. They were kept from recognizing him. 
Jesus went through that series of what things, and they told him, and he finally comes back and says, are you so dull, something to that effect. And then it says in Luke 24, verse 7, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So that's in the prophets and in Moses, the law. And so I wanted to do this series from that viewpoint, that we be reminded as we look even at one of the most familiar stories in the Bible, that first and foremost, we're going to ask the question, what do I learn about Jesus in this story? I think too often we learn uh, unintentionally what is the moral of this story. What is the quippy truth that I can take home with me about this story? Or, and this is valid, sometimes we look at it and say, where do I fit in this story and what does it mean that I should do? Now, David and Goliath, and I don't mean to be sarcastic, but if you read the story of David and Goliath, and you were headed home as a child, mom and dad says, what did you learn in Sunday school today? And you say, we well, learned the story about David and the giant. And they say, well, what did you learn? Well, that sometimes the little guy can defeat the big guy as long as the little guy is trusting in God. Now, if you would have said that the little guy always defeats the big guy as long as he's trusting in God, I don't know if that matches with our life experience. So you look at the story and you say, that's what I learned today from David and Goliath. That sometimes, when the little guy trusts in God, he gets the victory. And you just quit there. You don't beg the other question. What happens the other times? Well, the big guy just pounds, pounds him into salt. Uh, you know, sometimes that happens. We live in a sinful world, and sometimes bad things do happen to good people. But, be encouraged, occasionally... Perhaps when God's in a good mood, the little guy will get the victory. And it, we're so familiar with this story. You'll hear it in college football. You'll hear it in college basketball. You know, Eastern Illinois University is playing, um, excuse me, Duke University in the, uh, in the basketball tournament. It's a real David versus Goliath story. Does that mean that definitely the David in that equation is going to beat the Goliath? Well, probably not. And so we hit this story. We get a little bit of a quippy truth from it. We kind of have this moral, but we're not really sure, are we, what to do with this story. Is the point of this story that I should be a David and attack the Goliaths in my life? Because if that's the moral, I'm not even 100% sure what that means. What should I be doing? What Goliaths do I even have in my life? And what assurances do I have that God is going to give me victory over every obstacle? Paul prayed repeatedly that God would remove the thorn in his flesh. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So what I want us to do, back up here again, is to look at this story and ask, what do I learn about Jesus? Because I think it makes this story more valuable. At least I think it did for me. What do I learn about Jesus? Now, consider David and Goliath. What we're going to read here in 1, 7, uh, 1 Samuel 17. I'm going to start in at verse 32. As we have read, as Joyce read for us, David has left his home, left the sheep with the shepherds. We see this scene of these Israelite soldiers in the morning. They rally themselves from wherever they were sleeping. They charge down to the front lines, is the picture. And they are whooping and hollering and getting hyped up. 
But then we start to read that for the last 40 days in a row, this huge giant has come out and taunted them. And I think that's funny, not in the haha -ha sense. It's like the team that's been uh, hasn't won a game in three years, but they run out on the field, yeah, yeah, yeah and the you know the cheerleaders are like, you know, we can't be beat except all the times we have been for the last three years, and these guys go charging down to the front lines, and out steps Goliath. And panic hits them. Here we are, verse 32. David said to Saul, Let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Paul replied, You're not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he has been a fighting man from his youth. But say, uh, Saul, <laughs> David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. Because he has defied the armies of the living God, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic, put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened the sword over his tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. Then he uh, took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in a pouch on his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine with his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. He looked the boy over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut your head off, uh, cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air, the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet him, to meet him reaching into his bag and taking out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead, the sun, uh, stone on the forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with the sling and the stone without the sword in his hand, Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran over, stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword, drew it from its scabbard, and he killed him, cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron will quit there. Kind of graphic. Quite a story, familiar to us in many ways, at least parts of it. Maybe we haven't actually read through it in a while. Again, the initial question, what do I learn about Jesus in that story? The secondary question, how should I respond when I learn what I learn about Jesus? Now, God had brought judgment on the Philistines because of their wickedness. 
He had allowed them to be pushed out of the land that God promised to Abraham and that the Israelites were occupying. But for the last 40 days, this giant of a man, literal, has been coming out defying and mocking, defying God and mocking the army. And so David walks into this scene, a young boy, we don't know exactly how old. He tells his story about having watched his father's sheep, about having killed the bear and having killed the lion. He's not afraid. Saul is afraid, a man that we're told that's head and shoulders taller than the rest of the men in his army, a man who formerly had been a valiant warrior, but the presence of the Lord has left him now and fear has entered his heart. Eliab, David's older brother, right before the section we, that, that we read, Eliab gets mad at David and says, who are you to come walking up here and start talking like this, being so bold? Well, guess what? We found out in that scene with Samuel that Eliab was an awfully tall guy and a good-looking guy and a kingly-looking guy. And both of those guys should have been the champion. Now, NIV uses the word hero. I like the word champion. What we have here is this scenario. There are two entire armies gathered. They've come to this battle line, this valley, but what happens is the Philistines, one man steps out. He is the hero. He is the champion. He is the representative, the federal head of the entire army. And he says in this challenge, I, one man, will fight your best man, and we will see. And whoever wins this battle between the champions, if the Philistine champion wins then the Philistine army participates in the victory. If the Philistine champion loses, then the Philistine army loses with him. Same on the Israelite side. It is a battle of champions. They're going to save the mess of having hundreds of men go into battle. They're going to send their two best guys, their champions, their representatives, and everybody will live, have victory, or die in defeat based on the actions of their champion. So nobody wants to be Israel's champion. Nobody wants to be Israel's savior. Nobody wants to be Israel's hero until David comes. But he doesn't fit the expectation of the hero. He doesn't fit the expectation of the champion. He doesn't have the pedigree that they want to put their hope and trust in this one young man to be their savior because if he loses, they lose with him. And so we have this story. Eliab discourages him. Saul discourages him. But David, in his confidence and his boldness, goes forward. David's language you come at me with sword and spear, but I come at you in the name of the Lord. David's confidence is in the Lord. Now, in this picture, and David identifies this, in this picture, Goliath is the representative, the champion of opposition to God's people. What is God's plan for God's people in this story. God is actively working on bringing the Savior of the world into the world through Israel. So these people who are occupying this army that is occupying, defending this promised land, it is God's purpose that these people will live and will flourish and will bring into the world the Savior of the world so that everybody can participate in that salvation. There is a bigger story overarching the story we're looking at. So when we see Goliath coming to oppose God's plan, he is literal, he is a real person, but he is representative a representative 
who is opposing God's plan. He is a little enemy representing the big enemy who always opposes God's plan. Whenever God's plan, and it always is, is moving forward, there is opposition. There will always be little Goliaths popping up on behalf of the enemy to oppose the plan, the will of God. God's will is for people to flourish. God's will is for people to enjoy creation, salvation, fellowship with him as he intended from the beginning of creation. And this rebellion against God as God, this defiance against God as God is sin. Now, Saul comes out. He calls down curses on David in the name of his Philistine gods. If you recall that story, there is that story where Dagon, the idol uh, that is worshipped by the Philistines, what happens to him during the night? Falls face down. What happens to Goliath? Face plant. Same thing. God has some uh, uh, consistency. But as we look at this story, that's what we're seeing. That there is opposition to God's will. There is opposition to God's desire. There is an enemy who hates to see God accomplish what he desires. And so that's the picture we have. David marching down. This exchange that happens between David and Goliath saying, I, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, verse 45. The Lord will hand you over to me. I like that little exchange right before this when Saul is being discouraging to David. And he says to him, you can't do this. You're just a boy. It's not only the enemies of God that will discourage the plan of God. Sometimes the people who are supposed to be God's people will say, oh, we can't do that. Fear has struck the army of God. Fear has presented itself. If somebody goes and fights Goliath, Goliath can't win. So Goliath's 40 days of taunting, 40 days of talking tough that is causing fear, that's what's preventing God's people from moving forward and flourishing because no one will pick up the fight. So Saul and David are having this conversation. David says, in confidence, the Lord's delivered me before. When I'm watching the sheep that belong to my father and a bear comes along and a bear grabs one of the sheep and puts it in his mouth and starts to take off, I go after the bear. I like what he says. It's graphic. I grab the bear by the hair. I'll bet bears hate that. <laughs> We've got that little black dog, 12 pounds. If I catch that hair right under his chin and just grab it, oh, he hates that. Which, sadly, I should quit. But he says that. I grab that bear by the hair. I reach in its mouth take out the sheep, and then when the bear turns on me, I strike it and kill it. Same story with the lion. My running joke is that the hardest thing in the Bible for me to believe is that Samson caught all those foxes and tied their tails together. This is right there. You know, you want to say, well, what kind of bear? Was it a Polar bear? It was a grizzly bear, a brown bear? Koala bear. Was it a koala bear? Is that what you grabbed? You know, the same way. This is an incredible claim that David makes. And think of that. Who is the person in the story of David with these sheep? David, on behalf of the sheep, grabs the enemy by the hair, reaches into his mouth, pulls out the lamb. If David wins, 
the lamb wins. But if David loses, it's not just that lamb that loses. David becomes the hero. David becomes the champion. David becomes the defender and the savior of the entire flock. It all rests on him. It is not something that the sheep are doing. They either get saved or they get destroyed. And David is saying, I've already functioned as a champion. I've already functioned as a hero. I've already functioned as a savior. This is the same thing. I will go out, and I like those two things. I grabbed, God delivered. And those two things are tied together. David does what he can, but he recognizes that God is doing the part that he can't. David said, I went out and grabbed it, but when it turned around on me, God delivered me. I struck it and I killed it, but God delivered me. And so he gives this picture. The whole world will know that it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves. The battle is the Lord's. He will save. And that's the mindset of David. Again, if you and I approach this story and say, we all need to be more like David, we need to run out and attack the Goliaths in our lives, we might be a little bit encouraged, inspired, but really not sure what to do, or we might be a little discouraged and deflated because I don't think I can attack giants like David did. And so what it becomes is this story in the Old Testament about this one time when God really liked this one guy and he put his blessing on this one guy and this one guy won. And so I'm encouraged to think that sometimes God blesses the little guy that's on his side and allows him to win. But that's not a whole lot to walk away with from this story. But if we approach it from the standpoint, what do I learn about Jesus? Well, I'm not David in this story. David is a little Jesus, if I can use that phrase. David is doing what Jesus is going to do. David represents, is the champion of, will be the savior of Israel, the army, the people. And if he wins, they win. What did they have to do? They didn't do anything. Eliab certainly didn't do anything. Saul didn't do much. All of their hope is in David. And David is going to go out and personally go to war against what opposes God. That's a picture of Jesus. Jesus is not the Savior that was expected exactly. He doesn't appear to be the Savior that was ex expected. He goes up against everything that opposes God. If he wins, those who are in him win. If it was possible that he lose, then everybody would lose. But all of our hope is in the champion. I don't have to be David. Jesus is David. Jesus is the champion in this story. And that really changes the perspective. That really moves away, allows me to move away from this story with something that helps me live. That Jesus is represented in David. Now, we'll talk about this in Sunday school. I hope you stick around. There's more, where do I fit in the story then? That's the question that I come up secondarily with. But secondarily, how do I respond to the fact that Jesus is my champion? But then I still am kind of curious, where would I fit in this story? If you look at the analogy that in David, we see a preview of Jesus being our champion. Then if we held consistently, we would say, so... Jesus is going to march down to the battle line courageously 
with a sling in his hand, and he's going to face the enemy, everything that opposes God, and he's going to strike it down and kill it and cut its head off. Well, that's not what happens. At least it's not what appears to happen. What we see when Jesus comes in the flesh, he comes in humility. Again, not what was expected, but when it comes to the battle, he dies on the cross. The battle is very different than we might have expected from the preview that we got in David and Goliath. And then there is those three days Paul mentioned, of course, in the communion meditation. And then Jesus raises from the dead, resurrection. And so we have to follow through here a little bit. And it partially answers that question that I asked. Where do I fit in the story of David and Goliath? I think there are several places, but follow me on this one. I'm not nine foot tall. I've never called down curses on God's people in the name of a foreign God. I don't feel like I'm Goliath. Yet, there is something in me that opposes God as God. At least there certainly was. Because when I read Romans and it says that I was alienated from God, that I was God's enemy, that I was separated, that I was dead and not alive, my condition, certainly pre-salvation, my condition was as a little Goliath. Okay, I, I will take that. I don't feel like I'm the giant federal head representative of the those who oppose God, but in my own little kingdom, in my own little way, through pride, selfishness, stubbornness, and a host of other ways, I rejected God as God. That's what sin is. I looked at the circumstance and said, this is what God would want. This is what I would want. I choose me. And so in that way, I do fit, I think, spiritually as a little Goliath. Come back to Jesus. Why did Jesus have to die? Because the little Goliath in me has to die with him. Because there has to be a participation in the death of Jesus. The old man has to die and be buried. So that through the power of the Holy Spirit the new man may be resurrected. And it is in this burial, death, burial, and resurrection that in the spiritual, we go from being little Goliaths to becoming little Jesuses. Stay for Sunday school and tell me if you don't like that, because I, I understand where that's a little weird. That's a little different way of saying it. But the old man dies with Jesus. He had to participate. He died for my sin, and I have to die with him so that in his resurrection I can be raised with him. And then he is the conquering hero that we see. He is the conquering warrior that we see in Revelation. The little Goliath needed to die with Jesus so that we could be born again as little Jesus's. 1 John 3, 8 says that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Jesus becomes the destroyer of the destroyer. Jesus is the champion who defeats everything that opposes God. But he doesn't just defeat it, he restores it. Everything that God intended the fellowship, the salvation, the flourish, the life that is truly life, everything that God intended originally before sin came, before we individually rejected God as God in our own little ways, all that God intended 
is restored to us in our being born again, in our death, burial, and resurrection participation, participation with Jesus. So I hope that's helpful to us. I hope that that's a fresh way of looking at the story of David and Goliath. My inspiration to you is not go out and attack the Goliaths in your life. The inspiration is to go out in Christ who has already defeated the Goliaths in your life. Now we're going to look as we follow through with David. David still had some issues. David still has had some pride and some selfishness and some opportunities and times when he would reject God as God in his life. There were little times when that ugly little Goliath would still rear his head, that sin nature that Romans speaks about in our lives. But he was in Christ. He had participated in the victory. Let's stand. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the hope we have in Jesus, that he is our champion, he is our savior, he is our deliverer. We do not have to fight the battle for ourselves, but rather in Christ, we fight for him through the strength, through the help of the Holy Spirit. We do want to overcome, we do want to participate in the victory that's already been won. But Lord, help us to cease our striving. Help us to try, or trust and not try. Lord, I ask your blessing on us today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would work this message into our hearts, that you might be glorified. If there's any here today, Lord, that needs prayer, if there's any here today that needs to make a decision for Christ, we pray by the grace of Jesus through the working of your Holy Spirit that they may come to know their Savior, their champion. And it's in his name we pray.